Hello, everyone. Welcome to, uh, to this event. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to, uh, or to welcome you to this event on the Algerian economy, discussing the lessons from the past, the current uh, dynamics, and the implications for the future. My name is Emir Bedoui. I'm a lecturer here at SOAS on the political economy of development, and I'll have the pleasure to chair and, and moderate this event, which is hosted by the SOAS Middle East Institute and in partnership with the Institute for um, Social Science Research on Algeria, a recently created institute by Tim uh, amongst other Israel. Algeria is the, I think most of you would know, the largest country in Africa and the Arab world. Yet, there aren't many events uh, on Algeria, and especially not on the Algerian economy, which is why, uh, and as shown by the high number of registrations in the first days in which the event was promoted, there's a lot of appetite for this kind of platform for discussing, for discussing the, the, the challenges, dynamics, and, uh, and, uh, and processes of the Algerian economy. So I really hope that this is the first of many in this field, and you'll be welcome to join the other events on Algeria as well here. So today is also a very particular date, right? It's the anniversary of the Algerian revolution. So it's no surprise that this event is taking place on the same day. Uh, the Algerian revolution was seen as a means to achieve political independence, but economic development was also perceived as a means to achieve economic independence on the long term. So this makes this event particularly relevant on this day. So still largely dependent on the export of fossil fuels, the Algerian economy is today at a crossroads, as you know. But what can be learned from the country's past history and past attempts at achieving economic development and diversifying the economy? What are the key drivers? We also hurdles to promote entrepreneurship, industrialization, digitalization, and innovation in Algeria. These important questions will be addressed today in this panel that brings together leading Algerian economists with complementary expertise on, on those different issues. And they're therefore best suited to answer some of these questions. But this will also be a discussion uh, and we'll get to also you know, hear from you. And I know people like Professor Ben Guzien who happens to be in London today. So it's great news for us and that will enrich the discussion. So uh, let me start by introducing our speakers today. Starting with the one that we have in person, Tim Hinen, who is a political economy researcher. She's the co-founder and co-director of the Institute for Social Science Research on Algeria and an associate fellow at the MENA program at Chatham House. She's currently writing her PhD thesis at the London School of Economics, uh, where I also used to be, so we were colleagues, uh, looking at China's digital Silk Road in North Africa. Her research in interest includes information, communication, and technology, ICT, knowledge economy, and China's presence in Africa and the Middle East. Before starting her PhD, Tin Hinan was part of a research team working on questions relating to North-South knowledge production and data-driven innovation at the LSE. Uh, she holds a uh, MSc in Development Studies from the LSE and a BA in Politics from SOAS, University of London, where we are. The second speaker, Fatih Hatalahit, is an economist, currently a senior fellow at the University of Marburg in Germany, and a research associate at Economics, a research unit of the CNRS and the University of Paris Nanterre. From 95 to 2002, she was a researcher at the CNRS, but before that, she was a lecturer at the University of Oran in Algeria. Her publication record focuses on the transformation of the Algerian economy institutional change, uh, industrial and monetary policies, and gender economics. Third, uh, Professor Tayyip Hafsi is a professor at HEC Montréal, the business school of the University of Montréal. His research and teaching focuses on various topics related to business policy, business management of complex organizations. He's written more than 120 uh, academic articles and has authored about 45 books uh, or monographs. He's been awarded several prizes, which are too many to list today, um, but just to cite a few, 
the Francois Albert Angers Best Teaching Book Award and the Cooper's Library and Best Business Book Award. He holds a master's of science uh, in management from the Sloan School of Management in the MIT and a doctorate in business administration from the Harvard Business School. Last but not least, uh, Mabro Kaib, who I like to call uh, a Renaissance man, because although his bio lists him as a highly experienced manager, I would add that he's also an experienced lecturer, policy advisor, and entrepreneur. You'll see what I'm talking about once he starts his presentation. In 2016, he founded, he co-founded a startup in the precision agricultural business that is developing solutions for smart irrigation and integrated resource management for farmers, including in Algeria. He's also a co-founder of Polagal SPA, a company specialized in agricultural logistics and services. He holds a engineering degree, uh, he's also an engineer, uh, in strategic management um, from the Ecole Nationale Polytechnique and executive training programs from the Harvard Business School and the University of Oxford. So, and so he'll be able to talk about the whole startup <laughs> ecosystem, not only from an academic perspective, but from his own experience. So a little bit of housekeeping before you start, before you start this event, and then you'll have enough hearing from me. So this is a hybrid event. Right, that takes place both online and on campus. A live translation is provided for those of us joining us online. So you just click on the button, uh, on the button at the bottom, and you can uh, trans you can hear the French or uh, Arabic translation. The event is recorded, but not the Q and A. So you can just speak freely, and we can have a discussion. Nothing is recorded. Uh, we'll have about 90 minutes. Each panelist has about 12 to 15 minutes to present. So I'll let you know when you have about five minutes left. Um, and then we'll open for Q&A and discuss the presentations or any questions that you might have. So on that note, uh, let's start with uh, the presentation by uh, Professor uh, Tayyab Hafsi. If you can share your slides. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. You should be able to share your slides soon. Sure, I will do that. Can you see my slides? Yeah, super. If you can put them in full screen. It would sure, be I'll do that, better. I'll do that, sure. Okay, thank you, Amir, for inviting me to this uh, great gathering. I'm, I'm very pleased to share the floor with this uh, with this great panel, uh, Fatihat, Inhinan, and uh, Mabrook. Um, the my presentation is really a tale of how the economics or the economic the Algerian economy is being built from the bottom up, and uh, I uh, I want to tell you about uh, the research that we did. Uh, and uh, about the results that we that we got out of this research, uh, the the work inspiration, of course, comes from uh, people who have been working on entrepreneurs like Schumpeter and Kirzner. Uh, also, perhaps very important, the work by uh, Alfred D. Chandler, a uh, business historian at Harvard, uh, who died last year, I think. In particular, his uh, book, The Visible Hand, uh, Chandler was arguing that uh, the economy is not built by the invisible hand of the market, but is uh, built by the visible hand of managers and entrepreneurs. And uh, of course, the market is uh, very important. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And so the question that we ask is, would the Algerian, uh, perhaps the Maghreb economy, be built by its entrepreneurs? Uh, perhaps uh, to tell you about the, where I start from, uh, give you an idea of how I, the assessment I make of uh, Algeria. Um, few things, anomie, inability, inability to build large systems of cooperation, uh, outside influence, uh, in particular in Algeria, colonization uh, effects are still present and probably will be for a long time. And with the uh, with that, of course, I include not only physical, but also mental and uh, and intellectual influence. 
aspiration to liberty, uh, of course, because of the long struggle for liberty that lasted uh, more than sen I mean, several centuries, I should say, uh, leads to resistance, which is, that's which is interesting, leads to resistance to organizational constraints. High level of education and dissatisfaction, turbulent youth, and of course, turbulent, but also a source of uh, high energy. Uh, in my belief, a bubbling uh, desire to create and a lot of initiative, a source, of course, of uh, entrepreneurial behavior. And all these elements, if you will, uh, call for a micro look and perhaps bottom up built, uh, built up of theory and practical knowledge. Um, just to let you know, I'm, I'm thinking of entrepreneurs in all areas, okay, economic, public administration, and so on and so forth. Um, so the questions are, as I said, uh, we're interested in whether the entrepreneurs are building the economy, but actually we have biases. We want to see, we wanted to see if they build also their communities, if uh, they build values and institutions, if they, are they building a new societal model? Uh, perhaps a word also about uh, institutions uh, in the new institutional theory. Institutions, if, if I want to simplify, are three, uh, are of three types, if you will. One is uh, laws and regulations. Second are norms of behavior. And third is the mental schema, I mean, what we get out of education and culture. Uh, of course, institutions mean stability. And uh, when we talk about change, uh, that means we are in situations of trouble. Uh, but also uh, trouble is uh, opportunity in some in some cases. And so the question is whether in the troubles that I was describing about Algeria, if the entrepreneurs are actually building both economy, the economy and the institutions. And of course, we believe that this is a very important topic for uh, at least academia. Uh, in Algeria, we tried, of course, to study firms. Uh, that we are I mean dynamic firms, firms that are succeeding, but also dynamic public sector organizations. So we had to identify the candidates, get access, build the cases, and and then of course build uh, build theory. So the, again, we you can see the question are always the same that that are coming back. Just to give you an idea of uh, some of the studies that we conducted. Um, we have about 20 cases that we that we have been working on. Uh, just to give you an idea, is Hadrab Rab uh, is the, the builder or has been the builder of the largest private uh, conglomerate in, in Algeria, the largest private company as well. Uh, Mohamed Mazouni is, uh, is one of the pioneers in building Sonatrak, Sonatrak, which is the oil company in Algeria. The Benamor family is the one I'm going to be talking about and telling you more about it. Uh, Hania Zazwa and Nassim Bambarek, the, the, these are examples uh, uh, of a very a micro company, uh, people who have been trying to sell uh, artifacts, small artifacts uh, that are also art pieces. And so it's really a micro company. And, and then finally, Dr. Nuh. Which is uh, which has been the builder of a foundation in uh, Ardea, in the in the region of Ardea, in the center south of Algeria, and who has been uh, with, with Amidul has been the uh, the builder of a new city that has received a lot of awards as being the typical ecological. Uh, uh, town, if you will, and they have received a lot of uh, international awards. Okay, I want to tell you to, this is the, the main point, I want to tell you about the Benamor case. Benamor is, uh, is, was a very uh, small family, okay, uh, that was uh, involved in uh, small food markets. And uh, they realized that uh, uh, that tomato, or at least uh, tomato products that, that they sold, uh, were very important and, uh, and, and the demand for those products was, uh, was very important in Algeria, but also in France when they, when they settled earlier. So, uh, of course, as you know, uh, tomato is the basis of the couscous sauce and uh, widely used, if you will, in Algerian cuisine. 
1970, it was mostly imported in concentrated source, uh, source cans. So they decided to build a plant to make tomato from imports, but also from uh, the local production of tomato. Uh, of course, the demand for the Benamor products was really very important. But soon, uh, when they wanted to grow, they they found that there were limits, and the limits were supply limits. They couldn't find tomatoes on the on the on the product, on the market. Um, when they went to see the growers, the growers told them that there was no possibility to increase production. Tomato production was a challenge. Uh, no water, poor technology, and also that was a, the situation was uh, was really dire at that at the time, since uh, peasants were abandoning agriculture. Uh, so the, the Benamor couldn't believe that. So they they started looking into solutions into that. So they hired the leading figure in agriculture in Algeria, a militant farmer, an agronomist also. And they were looking for experience in Europe, in particular in Spain. So they, they brought technology, uh, both in water use and tomato farming. They built experiments with farmers. This is a, a small private company. Uh, they convinced skeptical farmers, they guaranteed income from experiments. Uh, they provided also the seeds, uh, baby plants, if you will. Uh, and so they they convinced the farmers. And so to make the, the story short, against all odds, in an area where the government has been trying for more than 30 years to, to do things without success, they succeeded in transforming the region, which is the the uh, region in the southeast of Algeria, uh, Gelma, to transform the region from brown and bare to green, red and blooming. Farmers became more enthusiastic and their hairs went back to farming. The Benamor production went from 3,000 tons to 60,000 tons, and of course they became the market leader. Imports were not needed anymore. Benamor uh, convinced the government to get involved. The government was impressed by how this small company has been able to, to transform a whole region, actually, uh, in agriculture and transforming practices in agriculture, uh, starting new patterns of cooperation with, between the government and the private sector. Uh, of course, you cannot succeed in everything. Ben Amor was also involved in couscous, producing for couscous, if you will. And they tried to replicate the same success in in the wheat products. And of course, it was not, it didn't it didn't succeed. Uh, so that simply tells you that the, how hard it may be to to do things uh, in in that environment. Perhaps some lessons and conceptualization. Of course, here. Lessons are many. I'm just pulling some for, for your benefit. First, the dominant values that we see in not only Ben Amor, but also in those companies that have succeeded. Excellence and ambition. These companies have values of drive to be excellent and professional, a drive to be among the best. Belonging, ethics, respect. Most of these companies were uh, honest, uh, they they, pro they promoted honesty, compassion, altruism. They were self-confident. And of course, self-confidence was based in this particular case, in most of the cases, on religion and spirituality. Equity, exemplarity, proximity, sense of responsibility to society and community. So just to... Uh, give you uh, to give you how they how coherent they, coherent they were in practice. They emphasized universal excellence, certification of all products and processes, training of personnel. Most of these companies had actually internal schools. Uh, they emphasized people, uh, consulting with them, proximity with the with their with their own employees, listening to their own employees, being close and approachable. Uh, in the discussion, I could tell you more about that if you wish. Uh, they emphasized community. They built actually community, structured the communities in which they were. And of course, they tried to remain invisible, not being seen, especially by, by the government. The conclusion is, it is probably likely that when we look at the uh, situation of Algeria, which is a troubled society, 
like lead entrepreneurs and managers are the key to building a vibrant economy and perhaps even a healthy society. So I'm going to stop there and uh, come back with the discussion. Thank you, Tayeb, uh, for this quite insightful presentation. Now let's continue with uh, with Fetiha mm -hmm. on the theme of industrialization before we bring in the perspectives on digitalization innovation and end with Mabruk. So I will now share uh, Fetiha's slides here. And Fetiha, the floor is uh, yours. Just tell me when to... Uh, <laughs> I think we lost Fetiha. So actually, I did get sorted out. Let's maybe Tim Hunan, if you don't mind going for it, and then. Uh, We'll bring Fatiha later. Okay, so we should find things. Yeah, I think. Yeah. As you do you think it's easy to do it like this one? This place? Or is it more difficult? It's only on this end. No, this is just the screen that is reflecting this. This is the right color? Like? No, not really, actually. <laughs> I don't know why I'm just coming. Do you want to do that? 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 Sorry, you can just screen share directly from the Zoom. Okay. Share screen. Well, hi everyone. I was expecting to start presenting a bit later, but technical issues. Uh, very happy to be here, very happy to be back at SOAS. I'm a SOAS alumina myself, always happy to be back here, uh, especially on such an important occasion. So as Amir mentioned, this is the 68th anniversary of the glorious Algerian revolution. And this year marks the 60th anniversary of our independence. Uh, so very excited to be here. I was asked by Amir to talk to you about Algeria's digital economy and the ICT sector. And I wasn't sure what to tell you, to be honest. And because the title of this big event was about, you know, Algeria's economy, its past, its present, and its future, I thought that I would just try to historicize the ICT sector in Algeria, kind of tracing the main evolution of the ICT sector and kind of focusing on the major political and economic changes uh, in the country since independence in 1962. Uh, while doing this, I will focus on the weight of ideologies and politics in shaping the main ICT policies of the country. So I divided the timeline in four major periods, as you can see, um, and they're all separated by critical junctures that I will explain. It might be evident for Algerianists in the room and non, like not evident at all for non-Algerianists in the room. 
uh, feel free to, to challenge this. This is not part of my PhD. As Emir mentioned, I mainly work on China's digital investments in Africa. This is just like lots of intellectual curiosity and like a conjunctural presentation for today. Um, so I'm going to start with the first period, 1962, um, 1986, building computer in defiance of the resource curse. So this period of history, which is actually not that well studied, is very significant. So there were huge efforts made by the Algerian state to try and diversify the economy. And that was part of the whole ideology at the time, was like strong socialist ideas dominating the top of the Algerian regime. And the ambition was to, you know, create a diversified, technologically advanced economy. Uh, so huge investments at rapid industri industrialization, mm -hmm. uh, lots of investments in investing in human capital, education. So at the time, in 1962, 85% of the Algerian population cannot read and cannot write, right? So like, huge challenge. Um, and so the, the Boumedian regime, starting from 1965, uh, realized the importance of ICT. And we had ICTs that started being used both uh, within civilians and, and within the military. Um, so Algeria adopted its first IT plan in 1968, quite early for a developing nation. And that was because it was copying France's own digital policies and IT policies. The ambitions were big. So Algeria was literally following a, you know, a major technological leader. So in 1966, uh, France had adopted Le Plan Calcul, the Calcul Plan, and that was Charles de Gaulle's attempt to uh, kind of achieve more technological independence from the US. And Algeria adopted similarly an ambitious plan to also achieve technological independence. Uh, just a year later, it created the CERI in 1969. So the CERI is the Centre d'études et de recherche uh, en informatique, so the Center for Studies and Research on Computer Science, which later became the prestigious ESI, École Nationale Supérieure d'Informatique. Um, at the time, so already in the late 60s, Algeria was training high caliber IT engineers. Uh, it was also manufacturing computer uh, computers at the time. This is quite significant. So in the 70s, there was the production of Mitra 125 uh, that you have here. Uh, and uh, it, it also integrated SIMs, so like high levels of value addition at the time. It also had some modems uh, that like, like this one that you can see here uh, that you know had a capacity of 30 to 960 megabytes per second. So not your best options mm -hmm. if you want to stream a Netflix movie, but it was still quite something at the time, right? So th there was this clear ambition at diversifying and industrializing. Um, so this was created by CINI, which was like the uh, Commissariat National on Informatics. There was also a lot of software development at the time, and actually Algeria was leading software writing in Arabic. And at the time when Microsoft wanted to develop software in Arabic, it was thanks to the help of an Algerian engineer at the time uh, called Bashir uh, Halimi. Uh, so this was obviously the product of a strong ideological commitment to achieve full independence. So not just territorial independence, but also uh, technological and economic independence. And that was the spirit of November the spirit of the revolution, right? Um, yeah, I think it's important because many writings that came after this phase, especially with the rise of neoliberal policies later on, kind of minimized the impact of this period. You know, it's always Algeria's economy has always been bad. And obviously like it, it did not end up being a huge success, but there are lessons to learn from this phase. And, and this part of history is, is hugely understudied. I'm just gonna move to the next bit. Okay. So the next phase would be the much 
less uh, exciting phase of 1986-1999. So as, as you may know, in 1986, there was a major drop in oil prices, which drove the country in significant economic and political turmoil. So in the 1990s, the so-called dark decade started, uh, and some call it the civil war. Uh, in 1994, Algeria had to undertake structural adjustments. And obviously, at the time, the priority was no longer in making computers, but really in saving the state and like saving the walls. Um, you had at this time also the rise of neoliberal ideology. So that was quite a significant ideational shift away from the early phase of development, which was about you know, state interventionism, having a big state, industrial policies, uh, import substitution policies at the time, towards kind of the dominance of the idea that you know, technological progress is best achieved with market efficiency. So uh, each country should focus on its comparative advantage, right? And by trading with other countries, we can all produce maximum welfare. So Algeria should not, according to this theory, focus on making computers, but it should focus on its natural comparative advantage, which is in oil and gas, right? So this is what the ideology at the time, or the doctrine at the time uh, said, uh, it was very much promoted by the World Bank and the IMF and kind of imposed through structural adjustment programs. Um, so at the time, yeah, uh, Algeria kind of stopped its ambitious industrial policy and was sent back to its natural position in the global economy, you know, at the bottom of the, the global economy, just producing oil and gas. Obviously, there's a huge problem with this theory. Comparative advantage is obviously constructed. Like, you know, if, if uh, today uh, Japan has an advantage in a sim productions, uh, it was very much constructed through industrial policies. So it's not something that we should just take for granted. And there are many issues, obviously. We know that uh, just exporting natural resources uh, ends up with like, uh, you know, there's unfavorable terms of trade for exporting goods with low value addition. And so the country was trapped here. There was no vision for industrial policy and there was a huge uh, brain drain. So all of the IT engineers I mentioned that were trained in the 70s and 80s, many of them left the country during the 1990s, right? So there was an important uh, kind of brain drain uh, taking place at the time. I'm moving to the next phase, that's 1999-2019. So I was thinking, making this like uh, presentation, the cool thing with autocratic states is that sometimes you just have two decades and it's one person. So you can just like analytically kind of just makes it easier. Uh, obviously, there, there are huge variations in, in this like two decades of Bouteflika in power. But um, yeah, so. During this period, as you may know, uh, there were high levels of clientelism and little commitment to economic diversification, right? Uh, export rates during this period averaged 95% hydrocarbons. So, you know, Algeria became this uh, typical country affected by the resource curse. Like in this phase, we could see all the symptoms of the Dutch disease and the resource curse. Um, there was natural global evolution, so there was like a catch up in terms of internet usage uh, between 2005 and 2019. So in 2005, internet usage was around 5%. And by 2019, it was just around like 60%. Uh, so that's slightly above world average at that point. Uh, this phase is not characterized by a specific economic doctrine or ideology, there was a lot of ideological opportunities. So when Bouteflika first arrived in power, that's in the late 90s, the price of oil was very low, right? And like, I think it averaged 20, $30 a barrel. And so at the time, there was a big push to liberalize the telecom sector. You know, there's a need for other sources of capital, 
for foreign capital uh, mainly. And this is when Jay-Z came in 2002 and then Najma 2004. These are large mobile carriers in the country. Uh, and then there was a second phase when like oil prices started going up and then the ideology changed and we saw more state interventionism, more kind of like assertiveness, especially in the highly strategic ICT sector. Uh, so there was a nationalization of Jizi during this part, so the state nationalized it, and there was a lot of political control over the internet. Fun fact, Algeria was in its GDP group, one of the largest countries in the world to roll out 3G, because as you may know, in 2011, there was the Arab Spring, and uh, people were using the internet to organize protests and to, to mobilize people. And so uh, the, the government decided willingly to delay the rollout of 3G. So we're one of the last countries uh, that, that got 3G. That was in December 2013. Uh, there was a lot of like catch up in terms of like infrastructure at this time. Uh, but it also came with like high level corruption scandals, right? So like, uh, especially with Chinese companies, actually with ZTE and Huawei, who were in charge of like building the backbone infrastructure at the time. Uh, so when the Hera came in 2019, Algerians were uh, overwhelmingly using the internet, uh, but mainly using social media. These are like uh, 2021 numbers of Algerian usage of social media. So we had about 24 million Algerians using Facebook, 6 million using Instagram and, and others. Uh, this is like the gender division of it. Uh, obviously, like in the rest of the region, male use the internet more than women. It's actually one of the regions of the world, the Middle East and North Africa, with the biggest gender gap in internet usage. Uh, so economically, well, there was internet usage but you know it, it's thin utilization of the internet so internet was used but with very low value addition so it's mainly to surf the net or like go on social media there's still a huge problem in kind of having more value addition in using the the internet and digital technologies more broadly the last period so after the Herak. Uh, till now. So there's much fun part about ICTs, but little ICT development. If you're a follower of Algerian news, like I am, uh, you would realize that the word startup is used pretty much all the time. Uh, it's kind of like the only uh, economic plan the regime has. So, uh, but, but there is little realization of what it would take to have a dynamic and competitive startup ecosystem. Uh, recently, in August, there was the announcement that the government would create a fund for startups, and it's endowed with 400 million US dollars. That's quite significant, uh, thanks to the Ukraine invasion. Now oil prices are up again, and so we can have like this kind of uh, big investments again. Uh, but you know, it comes without a clear digital industrial policy or a clear vision of how this money will be used. And so without a clear kind of um, listing of like the main uh, strategic sectors where this money should be invested, there is the risk of just depleting the money without resulting in any significant technological upgrading. Um, when we look at indicators currently, Algeria ranks quite poorly. So e-government development index, just like 130 out of 193 countries. Uh, network readiness index, Algeria ranks 102 out of 139 countries. And like in the government artificial intelligence readiness index, we're 118 out of 172. So you get the picture, like it's not, it's still like an oil dependent economy. It's not very competitive and innovative. Uh, and this is what Carmody and Murphy would actually call thin integration. So now in Algeria, we do have access to the internet in the big cities. There was a huge improvement in the quality of broadband access, but 
the usage of it remains not developmental basically so it's that there is a lack of local content creation a lack of local applications developed a lack of local platforms and like local digital services basically and there is no real strategy at the moment to, to really help develop more local content. Uh, there's also a problem when it comes to data sovereignty. The bulk of the country's digital data is stored outside in data centers abroad. And this uh, creates both political and economic issues, right? We know that data is economically valuable. However, at the moment, Algerian firms are not involved in processing this data and extracting economic value from it. And that's a major issue. Uh, so yeah, like at the moment, I think it's legitimate to ask the question of, you know, there is a debate of moving to 5G, but this network, this upgraded network infrastructure is very expensive. And we're not at the moment utilizing 4G at its full potential. It's hugely underutilized. So that needs to be a reflection on like, do we really need to spend millions, if not billions of dollars kind of shifting to 5G while 4G is not utilized to its full potential at the moment? Uh, so there is a need to think about strategic digital industrial policies and thinking, maybe I will just conclude on that, uh, thinking about what the November spirit would mean in the digital sector today. So by November spirit, I mean a bunch of 20 years old who decided one day that they will kick out the third biggest military power at the time and, and actually had nothing but their determination. And so what would this be today? What would be the November spirit in the digital sector? It's an open question, uh, maybe more local content creation uh, in Darija for the millions of Algerians who don't speak classical Arabic and French. Uh, maybe, yeah, more data localization, data sovereignty, uh, very important in the age of the knowledge economy. And yeah, just thinking about how to achieve technological independence for the future. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Tanina. And uh, what a nice way to link the Algerian revolution with the digital, digital revolution in the context of ICT development. Fatiha, our, um, are you ready to start your presentation? I think you're still muted. It's okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Can you, do you um, want to share your slides? Yeah. Um, share screen. It's okay. Um, can you see the slides? No. No? No. If you cannot share them, I can share them here and you just tell me when to go with the next okay. slide. Okay. Uh, Super. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Fatiha. Okay, thank you. So, um, my topic is on the industrial issue in Algeria the burden of history and institutions. Um, so the, the first other slide is, um, I presented the main periods uh, of um, this history and events, and they are um, the, uh, from 63 to 85. So a self-centered development model Industrialization was part of a will to break with the capitalist economy, both uh, externally with the state monopoly on, on foreign trade and um, in, uh, at the level of the domestic economy with a dominant public economic sector. And from um, 86 to 88, this system went to, into crisis um, and the, the industrial sector was uh, was heated. The centralized planning of the economy, which had been the dominant mode of regulation, was called into question. Uh, economic reforms was aimed uh, as a, at setting up the institutions of a market economy in 89, 91, and then structural adjustment programs 
from uh, 84 to 88, uh, 94 to 98, and then uh, the period from uh, 2001 to 2006, uh, after structural adjustment and the rising of hydrocarbon prices and greater stability, uh, the economy regained its main financial balances, but non-hydrocarbon growth remains sluggish and industry continues to decline. A new industrial strategy was put in place in February uh, 2007. And from um, 2009 to 2022, uh, there we see a return to close control of the state on the and of the administration on, on the economy. Uh, the other slide. The, can, you, can you put the... the yes. Industry in the Algerian development model uh, is um, theoretically founded on uh, first lesson from a certain lecture of the history of economic development, um, in a, tele a teleological lecture of the development of Europe in the, in the 18th and uh, 19th century. Uh, it is also based on structuralist theories of dependence and equal exchange, exploitation of the periphery by the center. Uh, a will to break with the, pa the past and accelerate the development. Uh, industry is the basis of this strategy uh, and technology plays a central role. Uh, it's believed that industrial development requires large scale in enterprises and modern technologies. The central role of the state as an agent of change and modernization is uh, more important. Is thinking as more important than that uh, that uh, which it has historically played in Europe, because it is justified by the weakness, the so uh, called weakness or absence of social forces that bring uh, about modernity. The model differs from the balanced growth theory of uh, Rania Nurks, uh, and also it differs from the model of industrialization through the promotion of exports, with, uh, which are the basic, basis of the success of the emergent countries. But he, it differs also from import substitution, which gives priority to consumer goods and the, and the domestic market. Uh, the, the theory of industrialization, uh, industrializing industries of the Bernice. Uh, the Bernice follows the tradition from Hirschman theory of unbalanced development, François Perrou, and also the Soviet model. And in, in this model, the steel industry is the hard core of the industries that provide development. And the, uh, agriculture doesn't play um, an important role. In, on the contrary, it's opposed to the Soviet model and the Marxist model. But in the Algerian model, there is a missing uh, element, is the capital goods industry, because um, both in the, in the Lebanese theory and also in the Soviet model, the capital goods industries play a central role in the reproduction of the whole productive system. Since Marx schemas of uh, reproduction, this sector has been at the heart, at the heart of industrialization strategies and at introversion. However, these are not found in the Algerian model. They are included in the basic industry, uh, and their role is not distinguished from that of uh, construction, material, or steel. And uh, apart from, um, from investment for agriculture and construction, there is no program for the production of capital goods for industry, which means that imports are relied upon uh, in the long term. It can be assumed that given the steady nature of the model, investment in this sector has been implicitly deferred to a later program. However, this missing link in the Algerian industrial strategy casts doubt on the declared will to build a totally autonomous industrial system. Despite the boldness of the announced objectives, it seems that the planner originally set limits to the model, in a way internalizing a fatality of underdevelopment that forbids pushing to the end the ambition, the ambition of industrial development in its uh, self-centered form. Um, 
the, the Algerian in, industrialization doctrine, it has been um, elaborated by um, through different stages, the Tripoli program in 62, 1962. Then um, we have a period of gestation um, till the 65, where the, the report on the presentation of the 66 capital budget outlines a long-term strategy of 15 years. Uh, the National Charter in 76. Uh, so the model is based, based on the the Benis, uh, industries, but unlike this model and like the Soviet one, there is no absolute priority of one branch over another. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Yeah. The uh, debates around the industrialization, it's important to see that uh, there are uh, recurrent debates uh, throughout this period about the role of industry, technology, the state, the private sector, um, and different social forces uh, in development. Uh, two currents are opposed, financials and industrialists. Financial are, uh, they uh, emphasize on, the, um, on the, the importance of the financial uh, balances and industrialists are uh, putting the, um, the accent on the size of investments and the volume of production. Uh, debates about also about the mode of regulation of the economy, centralized planning, uh, BS regulatory market, ex ante, ex post. But the run theories in the 90s and uh, in the 80s and the 90s inverted the representation of, of north-south flows instead, or, or south-north flows, instead of the center exploiting the periphery through an equal exchange, Oil rent, considered as an external income, is accused of annihilating production and hamper development. So there is um, an inversion of, of the, the vision of uh, the cause, the, the reasons of and their development. The central periphery opposition was undermined by the rise, undermined, undermined by the rise of the newly industrialized countries, the emerging countries, then by the fall of the Berlin Wall and it was replaced by the vision of a multipolar world in which the level of development depends largely on successful integration into the world economy. Uh, so next, the implementation of this strategy. Fatiha, sorry to, to cut you, but just I see that you are, we have, we have quite a few slides, um, yeah. about five minutes left. So I don't know if yeah. you want to talk about the new oh. industrial policy from 26, 2017 onwards or... So, oh, uh, yeah, so they are, you can change the, 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 the plans, the, you can change. Um, no, what are you going? <laughs> this one? Um, if you want, uh, but it's important to, it's important to say uh, uh, that this, uh, this strategy has been, um, you can, we, we can't, um, you know, um, the implementation of this strategy, uh, we can compare it with the objectives. Oh, you went to the new industrial policy, so you were you went very, very far. So, or maybe if you have the main point that you. So the new industrial policy of uh, two uh, two thousand and seven, uh, it was. Um, a strategy for uh, industrial recovery and development. Uh, it was defined as an import substitution policy in an open economy. Uh, and um, it was both a continuation of the previous policy described as an import substitution uh, in an administered economy and at the same time a break with it in so far as it takes note of the opening of the economy. The objectives are to increase the share of industry in the gross domestic product, to contribute to the diversification of exports and, uh, uh, and of the, the economy, and to the increase uh, of uh, job, uh, the contribution of industry to job creation. Uh, it relies on the on major sector, petrochemical, phosphate, steel, and non-ferrous metal. 
uh, and is uh, supposed to be implemented with uh, integrated industrial development zones, clusters, uh, and uh, also uh, to, to with public-private partnership and and also uh, the role of the private sector. Um, okay, um, you can change. But this uh, this strategy failed. Um, First, it, it was never officially adopted. No decision was taken on the means to be used for the implementation and no assessment was made. One of the main reasons uh, was the, the blocking of the, the banking and financial reform and the restrictive policy of credits to the economy, uh, for, uh, especially for the private sector. Warmed up by the failure of the industrialist policies of the 70s and 80s, the state no longer wanted to commit itself directly to an industrial project. The fear of sed um, sudden elastic drop in oil revenues and awareness that these revenues will eventually run out. So they, they gave the priority to the stability of macro financial balances, not to increase budgetary expenditures in an irreversible manner. Infrastructure investments should only represent a one-off expenditure, allowing surpluses to be absorbed and um, allowing monetary surpluses to be absorbed and jobs to be created. Uh, they target a sector relatively protected from competition, which would not have been the case for industry with the plan, the, the plan opening of the domestic market with the Euro Mediterranean free trade area uh, and the prospect of joining the VTO. Uh, can change, please? Uh, can next. Um... Okay, so, and the global financial crisis, uh, Algeria was little affected by the crisis thanks to its foreign exchange reserves and at low level of integration into global finance. But it was one of the countries who took immediately protectionist measures and tightened administrative controls on its economy. Uh, so, uh, uh, dictated by the pri priority given to macro financial stability in the context of exposure to inflationary shocks, these measures had the most immediate effect to of aggravating the situation of blocked productive investment by reinforcing the conditions of the financial system and increasing the constraint on the firms, on companies. Uh, so, uh, at the beginning, of, uh, this policy led to a dead end because the more surpluses accumulate, the more they paralyze the economy and excessive precautions can have catastrophic consequences. At the beginning of 2011, faced with the counterproductive nature of the measure taken to curb the rise of imports in a context of rising oil prices, but above all, to uh, defuse the protest encouraged by the revolt movement by setting the entire Arab world, the authorities uh, once again uh, allowed spending uh, and imports to run away. Okay, you, can. you have about one minute uh, to conclude. You can change, you can then. And the, the 2009 supplementary financial law, uh, it's the, the coming back of the, of, the, of the administration and state control over the, the economy. Um, you can change the, maybe, um, uh, Yes, about the, the the new growth model of industrial recovery in uh, is um, no. Oh. no. So you have about one minute left, uh, Fatima. Yeah. And now the the, the, the next the, the the last one is this new growth model of and uh, for industrial recovery. Uh, aim, aims at the structural transformation and diversification of the economy uh, and prioritize sectors. Uh, but uh, and you can you can change. Mm -hmm. We we see now um, that there is in Algeria a de-industrialization uh, model. 
for about three decades, Algeria has been undergoing a process of deindustrialization. Uh, in 2016, non-hydrocarbon industry accounted for only 5% of GDP. It was 35% in the late 19, uh, 1980. Although it was uh, never very important as industrialization was more capital intensive than labor intensive, the share of industry employment in total employment peaked at um, 18% in 1977 and is steadily declining to the benefits of services which in uh, 2015 accounted for over 61 percent of total employment and also the share of employment in agriculture declined most dramatically uh, productive gains are faster in services than in industry this phenomenon of um, the industrialization is it simply an expression of the failure of uh, the industrialization strategy in its project to achieve economic takeoff? Or is it a Schumpeterian process of creative destruction, which is beneficial for the uh, obsolete components of this industry, um, as it encourages a dynamic of adaptation to the rapid changes in the national and global economy? Uh, the explanation is also with uh, the Dutch disease. So um, the first interpretation insists on the importance of the existence of an ex ante strategy that overhangs and guides industrialization. The second, why uh, not denying the existence of a strategy minimizes its impact and so, as such and sees it rather as the result of contradictory factors and forces. And in conclusion, conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the we can uh, show the, the, the figures because it's the illustration of the, of mm -hmm. the, the desindustrialization. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There's going to be a few words. Yeah, yeah. And to, have to conclude, uh, I will conclude with the, 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 the question of co the coloniality of institutions. My idea is that, uh, you can go to the conclusion, please. Mm -hmm. My idea is that the reform undertaken in uh, the reforms undertaken in Algeria since the 1990 have not been successful. It is because the nature of the transition was mistaken. It has been thought that it was a transition from a socialist economy to a market economy and a transition model elaborated by the international economic and financial institutions was applied, whereas the deep roots of this economy and its institutions are colonial. So one of the challenges for me is to seriously address the colonial legacy, its persistence and its imprint on the institutions. In, in covering and analyzing them, it is not a matter of developing an anti-colonial ide ideological discourse, but of contributing to the knowledge of this economy and its institutions. I consider the question in terms of path dependency as understood by institutionalist theory. Uh, the question is what are we dependent on? What is the history of these institutions still what, what in the history of these institutions still determines them today? By questioning the, the coloniality of institutions, I do not presume to exhaust the question, but rather to complement other approaches more focused in particular on the conflicts of power that ran through the national movement and the construction of the post-colonial state. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Betty Hau. In the comment, we already have a few requests to access your slides, as it was quite rich and we didn't have time to, to go through it all, but hopefully we'll make them accessible if, if, if you want to read more. And now, last but not least, um, Brook to talk about startups, innovation, and drawing on both his academic and uh, professional experience. Mabrouk, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Amir, for this opportunity, and uh, happy celebration to all my uh, Algerian fellow citizen. Uh, can, can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Mabrouk, you have the, both the luxury and the curse of being the last presenters because your word is oh, yeah, last, yeah. but at the same time, you have the, if you can be 
brief so we can have time for discussion. It would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I will try to make it short so we have time for the Q&A and uh, discussion. So I'm going to uh, give you an overview of the ecosystem and uh, maybe share my talk about what are the challenges and the perspective uh, around uh, the startups in Algeria. So uh, in the ecosystem, first, let's talk about the Ministry of Startups and Knowledge Economy, uh, which was uh, created in 2020 and led by uh, young and uh, let's say, uh, yeah, a, a young minister and also uh, a former uh, start -upper, so it's quite interesting. And he is, has a, a young and um, very dynamic team. So it's uh, quite, it's important to, to I mean, to, um, to mention it because it's uh, so different uh, with regard to all the other um, ministries and uh, central administration. Um, Algeria Startup Fund is the state-owned uh, fund. I will talk about it uh, later on. Algeria Venture is the um, accelerator. It's a it's a public accelerator. I think it's the it's the only one in Algeria. There's no there's no other um, uh, accelerator for startup in Algeria. There's a a couple of uh, incubators, private incubators, uh, like uh, Incubme, Scilabs, Lean Incubator, uh, Tech2Hub, to name a few, that are very dynamic as well. And uh, they are also startups actually, because they are uh, young uh, entrepreneurs trying to help other uh, startups. Uh, business angels, there's, there's very few business angels. They are, uh, uh, to my knowledge, there's only the Casbah Business Angel, which is a, a structured club of business angels. Uh, there are some individual business angels and family offices, but uh, the, the maturity in Algeria is very, is very low. Uh, the startup label, uh, to, to, to have the a possibility to access to a uh, fund from the Algeria Startup Fund, uh, you need to have this uh, this label. It's a certification. There are some requirements like the, the age of the company, the turnover, it should be a small business and it, it has to be uh, innovative and, uh, and it has to have a, um, a scalable business model. Interestingly, to get this label, all the process is uh, digitalized, so it's uh, it's uh, quite an exception in uh, in our uh, environment. And you have then you if you are granted this label, you will have some benefits like tax exemptions. You have access to to funding, as I said, and uh, also acceleration with uh, uh, a venture that the public accelerators. I um, wanted to show you these figures. They come from the Ministry of Startups. As you can see, so there is an exponential growth of the number of startups. And uh, this year, we, uh, as far as I know, there's like 2,000 uh, startups. Uh, so I think there's two takeaways from this um, uh, slide. First, the growth of uh, startup creation is, uh, is uh, exponential, so it's quite uh, interesting. It's, um, it's a good news, but it's also, uh, it tells us that there's very few startups in Algeria, like 2000, imagine or uh, assume that 10% of them will be successful. We will have only 200 or so, um, uh, startups. So when we hear that the startups uh, will um, um, help the economy to grow, etc., I mean, there's a, a lot to do. Algeria Startup Fund. So it's the. I think it's the today. It's the only uh, option for uh, startups uh, to be funded. Um, now they have quite a, an interesting uh, amount of money to, to, uh, to fund the, the startups, uh, up to 1 million per project. 
of course you have to be to have the, the certification the label and uh, the the team will um, assess your business model and financial plan but it's quite straight for the the process is quite uh, straightforward there are a, a couple of challenges with this uh, this only option that uh, today the startups have in Algeria first is the valuation because uh, they will not uh, give a valuation they will not grant a valuation based on the the opportunity size or the the entrepreneur's uh, intrinsic qualities but uh, rather uh, the um, it's a patrimonial approach so um, they will definitely value the, the startup at a very low level. There is kind of control because um, it's a public uh, it's a public fund, so they need to uh, to protect themselves, and uh, it's it it has a, um, a direct impact on the management of the the startup. Well, in reality, there is not really an impact, but on paper, the, there is a, a kind of a steering committee uh, associated with the management of the startup. So it could be a, a constraint, but in reality, it's not the case. Huh? Uh, they just leave the, uh, the management uh, to the startups. And the exit, well, uh, I will uh, talk about it uh, later in the Q&A if someone wants to have more information about it. Uh, what are the challenges today for startups? First of all, the global environment uh, doing business in Algeria. The, uh, as you may know, the bureaucracy, the banking system, the foreign currency control, uh, in particular, is very difficult for a startup based in Algeria to have an international uh, uh, market. And even in Algeria, uh, because of the lack of uh, online payment system, it's uh, quite difficult to grow. Uh, market insight, there's a, it's always difficult to have uh, information about any market. Uh, the info is usually not um, up to date or available. Uh, and on top of that, um, we have uh, specific uh, challenges for the startup. So founder training, we need, we have, I've, uh, I've named some uh, incubators and uh, accelerators, but we need much more and uh, much more uh, professional in this, uh, uh, to, to help founders to, to be able to, to manage and grow their, their business. Uh, funding, financing, talk about this specifically for, uh, for a startup, uh, there's only one option, as, as mentioned, it, the legal status. Um, and last but not least, the brain drain. There are two levels. First level, it's very difficult today to get and uh, to keep uh, talented people because, because uh, most of the young, you know, educated people leave the country. So it's a, it's a challenge. And the second one is even the startups themselves. They are very... There are very good startups that are leaving the country to build their startup uh, outside the country. I can name like Club Labinemla or uh, uh, Brainboard. Those are brilliant guys. They've uh, started their, in Algeria and uh, they are extremely promising startup, but now they are not no more in Algeria. Uh, perspectives. Well, we have, you know, we have in Algeria young and talented people. They are business minded and they are really open to world, to the world. And um, so there is a uh, huge potential for uh, uh, for the startup to, to to grow. There's an interesting dynamic launched by the minister and his team and all the the ecosystem around. Uh, there is a need for diversification of the economy, so the government is really trying to, to support the startups uh, as a solution for the diversification. Uh, but there's also some uh, challenges regarding the government, pol the government policy, although they're, they're trying to use those startups uh, to fight uh, against the employment of youth, but uh, we we are um, let's say 
let's avoid the Ansage, um, the Ansage syndrome, let's say. Ansage was uh, a fund to, to help uh, young people to, to develop business and uh, at the end, uh, it was a collapse. Uh, another um, a challenge is the vision of the government. Actually, I had the opportunity to dis the opportunity to discuss with the uh, different uh, ministers and uh, executives in the uh, central administration, and uh, they, there's like a motto that they have to uh, 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 substitute import by uh, producing locally and they have the same mindset with the uh, uh, startup i'm not sure it's a it's a good idea uh, startup should be able to export and uh, not being a, a solution for import substitution and, uh, and another challenge is this uh, global vision and the coordination that is lacking actually yeah? so there are many uh, initiatives uh, within the government, but not always coordinated. And uh, it's difficult uh, for the people, the business people to understand where we're going. So this is it. Um, thank you. And uh, I will be uh, glad to answer your question. Thank you, Abrok, for a very comprehensive presentation on the startup ecosystem and landscape in Algeria.